Section 34 of Agatha Webb. This is a LibreVox recording. All LibreVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org. Recording by Gabby Cowan. Agatha Webb by Anne Catherine Green. Part 2 of Why Agatha Webb Will Never Be Forgotten in Sutherland Town the letter that followed this was very short dear james the package of letters has been received god help me to bear this shock to all my hopes and the death of all my girlish beliefs i am not angry only those who have something left to hold on to in life can be angry my father tells me he has received a packet too it contained five thousand dollars in ten five hundred dollar notes james james was not my love enough that you should want my father's money too i have begged my father and he has promised me to keep the cause of this rupture secret no one shall know from either of us that james Sable has any flaw in his nature the next letter was dated some months later it is to philemon dear philemon the gloves are too small besides i never wear gloves i hate their restraint and do not feel there is any good reason for hiding my hands in this little country town where everyone knows me why not give them to hattie weller she likes such things while well, I have had my fill of finery. A girl whose one duty is to care for a dying father has no room left in her heart for vanities. Dear Philemon, It is impossible. I have had my day of love and my heart is quite dead. Show your magnanimity by ceasing to urge me any longer to forget the past. It is all you can do for. Agatha dear philemon you will have my hand though i have told you that my heart doesn't go with it it is hard to understand such persistence but if you are satisfied to take a woman of my strength against her will then god have mercy upon you for i will be your wife but do not ask me to go to sutherland town i will live here and do not expect to keep off your intimacy with the Sables. There is no tie of affection remaining between James and myself, but if I am to shed that half-light over your home, which is all I can promise and all that you can hope to receive, then keep me from all influence but your own. That this in time may grow sweet and dear to me is my earnest prayer today, for you are worthy of a true wife agatha dear john i am going to be married my father exacts it and there is no good reason why i should not give him this final satisfaction at least i do not think there is but if you or your brother differ from me say good-bye to james from me i pray that his life may be peaceful I know that it will be honest. Agatha Dear Philemon, My father is worse. He fears that if we wait till Tuesday, he will not be able to see us married. Decide, then, what our duty is. I am ready to abide by your pleasure. Agatha The following is from John Savile to his brother James and is dated one day after the above dear james when you read this i will be far away never to look in your face again unless you bid me brother brother i meant it for the best but god was not with me and i have made four hearts miserable without giving help to anyone when i read agatha's letter the last for more reasons than one that i shall ever receive from her i seem to feel as never before 
what i had done to blast your two lives for the first time i realized to the full that but for me she might have been happy and you the respected husband of the one grand woman to be found in porchester that i had loved her so fiercely myself came back to me in reproach and the thought that she perhaps suspected that the blame had fallen where it was not deserved roused me to such a pitch that i took the sudden and desperate resolution of telling her the truth before she gave her hand to philemon why the daily sight of your misery should not have driven me before to this act i cannot tell some remnants of the old jealousy may have been still festering in my heart or the sense of the great distance between your self-sacrificing spirit and the selfishness of my weaker nature risen like a barrier between me and the only noble act left for a man in my position whatever the cause it was not till to-day the full determination came to brave the obloquy of a full confession but when it did come i did not pause till i reached mr gilchrist's house and was ushered into his presence he was lying on the sitting-room lounge looking very weak and exhausted while on one side of him stood agatha and on the other philemon both contemplating him with ill-concealed anxiety i had not expected to find philemon there and for a moment i suffered the extreme agony of a man who has not measured the depth of the plunge he is about to take but the sight of agatha trembling under the shock of my unexpected presence restored me to myself and gave me firmness to proceed advancing with a bow i spoke quickly the one word i had come there to say agatha i have done you a great wrong and i am here to undo it for months i have felt driven to confession but not till today have i possessed the necessary courage now nothing shall hinder me i said this because i saw in both mr gilrich and philemon a disposition to stop me where i was indeed mr gilchrist had risen on his elbow and philemon was making that pleading gesture of his which we know so well agatha alone looked eager what is it she cried i have a right to know i went to the door shut it and stood with my back against it a figure of shame and despair suddenly the confession burst from me agatha said i why did you break with my brother james because you thought him guilty of theft because you believed he took the five thousand dollars out of the sum entrusted to him by mr orr for your father agatha it was not james who did this it was i and james knew it and bore the blame of my misdoing because he was always a loyal soul and took account of my weakness and knew alas too well that open shame would kill me it was a weak plea and merited no reply but the silence was so dreadful and lasted so long that i felt first crushed and then terrified raising my head for i had not dared to look any of them in the face i cast one glance at the group before me and dropped my head again startled only one of the three was looking at me and that was agatha the others had their heads turned aside and i thought or rather the passing fancy took me that they shrank from meeting her gaze with something of the same shame and dread i myself felt but she can i ever hope to make you realize her look or comprehend the pang of utter self-abasement with which i succumbed before it it was so terrible that i seemed to hear her utter words though i am sure she did not speak and with some wild idea of stemming the torrent of her reproaches i made the effort at explanation and impetuously cried 
It was not for my own good, Agatha, not for self altogether. I did this. I too loved you madly, despairingly, and, good brother, as I seemed, I was jealous of James and hoped to take his place in your regard if I could show a greater prosperity and get for you those things his limited prospects denied him. You enjoyed money, beauty, ease. I could see that by your letters, and if James could not give them to you, and I could. Oh, do not look at me like that. I see now that millions could not have bought you. Despicable was all that came from her lips, at which I shuddered and groped about for the handle of the door, but she would not let me go, subduing with an unexpected grand self-restraint the emotions which had hitherto swelled too high in her breast for either speech or action. She thrust out one arm to stay me and said in short, commanding tones, How was this thing done? You say you took the money, yet it was James who was sent to collect it, or so my father says. Here she tore her looks from me and cast one glance at her father. What she saw I cannot say, but her manner changed, and henceforth she glanced his way as much as mine, and with nearly as much emotion. I am waiting to hear what you have to say she exclaimed, laying her hand on the door over my head, so as to leave me no opportunity for escape. I bowed and attempted an explanation. Agatha, said I, the commission was given to James, and he rode to Sutherland Town to perform it, but it was on the day when he was accustomed to write to you, and he was not easy in his mind for he feared he would miss sending you his usual letter. When, therefore, he came to the hotel and saw me in Philemon's room, I was often there in those days, often without Philemon's knowing it. He saw, or thought he did, a way out of his difficulties. Entering where I was, he explained to me his errand, and we being then, though never, alas, since, one in everything but the secret hopes he enjoyed, he asked me if I would go in his stead to Mr. Orr's room, present my credentials and obtain the money while he wrote the letter with which his mind was full. Though my jealousy was aroused and I hated the letter he was about to write, I did not see how I could refuse him. So after receiving such credentials as he himself carried, and getting full instructions how to proceed, I left him writing at Philemon's table and hastened down the hall to the door he had pointed out. If providence had been on the side of guilt, the circumstances could not have been more favorable for the deception I afterwards played. No one was in the hall, no one was with Mr. Orr to note that it was I instead of James who executed Mr. Gilchrist's commission. But I was thinking of no deception then. I proceeded quite innocently on my errand, and when the feeble voice of the invalid bade me enter, I experienced nothing but a feeling of compassion for a man dying in this desolate way, alone. Of course, Mr. Orr, was surprised to see a stranger, but after reading Mr. Gilchrist's letter, which I handed him, he seemed quite satisfied and himself drew out the wallet at the head of his bed and handed it over. You will find, said he, a memorandum inside of the full amount, 7,758.67. I should like to have returned Mr. Gilchrist the full ten thousand which I owe him, but this is all I possess, barring a hundred dollars which I have kept for my final expenses. Mr. Gilchrist will be satisfied, I assured him. Shall I make you out a receipt? 
he shook his head with a sad smile i shall be dead in twenty-four hours what good will a receipt do me but it seemed unbusinesslike not to give it so i went over to the table where i saw a pen and paper and recognizing the necessity of counting the money before writing a receipt i ran my eye over the bills which were large and found the wallet contained just the amount he had named then i glanced at the memorandum it had evidently been made out by him at some previous time for the body of the writing was in firm characters and the ink blue while the figures were faintly inscribed in muddy black the seven especially was little more than a straight line and as i looked at it the devil that is in every man's nature whispered at first carelessly then with deeper and deeper insistence how easy it could be to change that seven to a two only a little mark at the top and the least additional stroke at the bottom and these figures could stand for five thousand less it might be a temptation to some men it presently became a temptation to me for glancing furtively up i discovered that mr orr had fallen either into a sleep or into a condition of insensibility which made him oblivious to my movements five thousand dollars just the sum of the ten five hundred dollar bills that made the bulk of the amount i had counted in this village and at my age this sum would raise me at once to comparative independence the temptation was too strong for resistance i succumbed to it and seizing the pen before me i made the fatal marks when i went back to james the wallet was in my hand and the ten five hundred dollar bills in my breast pocket agatha had begun to shudder she shook so she rattled the door against which i leaned and when you found that providence was not so much upon your side as you thought when you saw that the fraud was known and that your brother was suspected of it don't i pleaded don't make me recall that hour but she was inexorable recall that and every hour she commanded tell me why he sacrificed himself why he sacrificed me to a cur she feared her own tongue she feared her own anger and stopped speak she whispered and it was the most ghastly whisper that ever left mortal lips i was but a foot from her and she held me as by a strong enchantment i could not help obeying her to make it all clear i pursued i must go back to the time i rejoined james in philemon's room he had finished his letter when i entered and was standing with it sealed in his hand i may have cast it a disdainful glance i may have shown that i was no longer the same man i had been when i left him a half hour before for he looked curiously at me for a moment previous to saying is that the wallet you have there was mr orr conscious and did he give it to you himself mr orr was conscious i returned and i didn't like the sound of my voice careful as i was to speak naturally but he fainted just before i came out and i think you had better ask the clerk as you go down to send someone up to him james was weighing the pocket-book in his hand how much do you think there is in here the debt was ten thousand I had turned carelessly away and was looking out of the window. The memorandum inside gives the figures as two thousand, I declared. He apologizes for not sending the full amount. He hasn't it. Again, I felt James looking at me. Why? Could he see that guilty wad of bills lying on my breast? 
How came you read the memorandum? he asked. Mr. Orr wished me to. I looked at it to please him. This was a lie, the first I had ever uttered. James' eyes had not moved. John, said he, this little bit of business seems to have disturbed you. I ought to have attended to it myself. I am quite sure. I ought to have attended to it myself. The man is dying, I muttered. You escaped a sad sight. Be satisfied that you have got the money. Shall I post that letter for you? He put it jealously in his pocket, and again I saw him look at me, but he said nothing more except that he repeated that same phrase. I ought to have attended to it myself. Agatha might better have waited. Then he went out, but I remained till Philemon came home. My brother and myself were no longer companions. A crime divided us. A crime he could not suspect yet, which made itself felt in both our hearts, and prepared him for the revelation made to him by Mr. Gilchrist some weeks after. That night he came to Sutherland Town where I was, and entered my bedroom, not in the fraternal way of the old days, but as an elder enters the presence of a younger. John, he said without any preamble or preparation, what are the five thousand dollars you kept back from Mr. Gilchrist? The memorandum said seven, and you delivered to me only two. There are dead knells sounded in every life. Those words sounded mine, or would have, if he had not immediately added, There, I knew you had no stamina. I have taken your crime on myself. Who am I really to blame for it, since I delegated my duty to another? And you will only have to bear the disgrace of having James Zabel for a brother. In exchange, give me the money. It shall be returned tomorrow. You cannot have disposed of it already. After which, you, or rather I, will be in the eyes of the world only a thief in intent, not in fact. Had he only stopped there? But he went on. Agatha is lost to me, John. In return, be to me the brother I always thought you up to the unhappy day the scene of Aiken came between us. You were lost to him. It was all I heard. You were lost to him. Then, if I acknowledged the crime, I should not only take up my own burden of disgrace, but see him restored to his rights over the only woman I had ever loved. The sacrifice was great, and my virtue was not equal to it. I gave him back the money, but I did not offer to assume the responsibility of my own crime. And since? In what a hard tone she spoke. I have had to see Philemon gradually assume the rights James once enjoyed. John, she asked. She was under violent self-restraint. Why did you come now? I cast my eyes at Philemon. He was standing, as before, with his eyes turned away. There was discouragement in his attitude, mingled with a certain grand patience, seeing that he was better able to bear her loss than either you or myself. I said to her very low, I thought you ought to know the truth before you gave your final word. I am late, but I would have been too late a week from now. Her hand fell from the door, but her eyes remained fixed on my face. Never have I sustained such a look. Never will I encounter such another. It is too late now, she murmured. The clergyman has just gone, who united me to Philemon. The next minute her back was towards me. She had faced her father and her new-made husband. 
father you knew this thing keen sharp incisive the words rang out i saw it in your face when he began to speak mr gilchrist drooped slightly he was a very sick man and the scene had been a trying one if i did was his low response it was but lately you were engaged then to philemon why break up this second match she eyed him as if she found it difficult to credit her ears such indifference to the claims of innocence was incredible to her i saw her grand profile quiver then the slow ebbing from her cheek of every drop of blood indignation had summoned there and you philemon she suggested with a somewhat softened aspect you committed this wrong ignorantly never having heard of this crime you could not know on what false grounds i had been separated from james i had started to escape but stopped just beyond the threshold of the door as she uttered these words philemon was not as ignorant as she supposed this was evident from his attitude and expression agatha he began but at this first word and before he could clasp the hands held helplessly out before her she gave a great cry and staggering back eyed both her father and himself in a frenzy of indignation that was all the more uncontrollable from the superhuman effort which she had hitherto made to suppress it you too she shrieked you too and i have just sworn to love honor and obey you love you honor you the unconscionable wretch who but here mr gilchrist rose weak tottering quivering with something more than anger he approached his daughter and laid his finger on her lips be quiet he said philemon is not to blame a month ago he came to me and prayed that as a relief to his mind i would tell him why you had separated yourself from james he had always thought the match had fallen through on account of some foolish quarrel or incompatibility but lately he had feared there was something more than he suspected in this break something that he should know so i told him why you had dismissed james and whether he knew james better than we did or whether he had seen something in his long acquaintance with these brothers which influenced his judgment he said at once this cannot be true of james it is not in his nature to defraud any man but john i might believe it of john isn't there some complication here i had never thought of john and did not see how john could be mixed up with an affair i had supposed to be a secret between james and myself but when we came to locate the day philemon remembered that on returning to his room that night he had found john awaiting him as his room was not five doors from that occupied by mr orr he was convinced that there was more to this matter than i had suspected but when he laid the matter before james he did not deny that john was guilty but was peremptory in wishing you not to be told before your marriage he knew that you were engaged to a good man a man that your father approved a man that could and would make you happy he did not want to be the means of a second break and besides and this i think was the bottom of the stand he took for james Zabel, was always the proudest man i ever knew he never could bear he said to give to one like agatha a name which he knew and she knew was not entirely free from reproach it could stand in the way of his happiness and ultimately of hers his brother's dishonor was his so while he still loved you his only prayer was that after you were safely married 
and philemon was sure of your affection he should tell you that the man you once regarded so favourably was not unworthy of that regard to obey him philemon has kept silent while i agatha what are you doing are you mad my child she looked so for the moment tearing off the ring which she had worn but an hour she flung it on the floor then she threw her arms high up over her head and burst out in an awful voice curses on the father curses on the husband who have combined to make me rue the day i was born the father i cannot disown but the husband hush it was mr gilchrist who dared her fury philemon said nothing hush he may be the father of your children don't curse but she only towered the higher and her beauty from being simply majestic became appalling children she cried if ever i bear children to this man may the blight of heaven strike them as it has struck me this day may they die as my hopes have died or if they live may they bruise his heart as mine is bruised and curse their father as here i fled the house i was shaking as if this awful denunciation had fallen on my own head but before the door closed behind me a different cry called me back mr gilchrist was lying lifeless on the floor and philemon the patient tender philemon had taken agatha to his breast and was soothing her there as if the words she had showered upon him had been blessings instead of the most fearful curses which had ever left the lips of a mortal woman the next letter was in agatha's handwriting it was dated some months later and was stained and crumpled more than any other in the whole packet could philemon once have told why were these blotted lines the result of his tears falling fast upon them tears of forty years ago when he and she were young and love had been doubtful was the sheet so yellowed and so seamed because it had been worn on his breast and folded and unfolded so often philemon thou art in thy grave sleeping sweetly at last by the deeply idolized one but these marks of feeling still remain indissolubly connected with the words that gave them birth end of part two of why agatha webb will never be forgotten in sutherland town recorded by gabby cowan